Hey y'all, Roger here. It doesn't take a rocket scientist at this point uh, to know that our country is extremely divided. And I wanted to give just a couple of thoughts about what's going to happen after the election. To put this very quickly, um, I think for context, it's helpful to know that it's not just the United States of America that is divided right now. It's much of the world. It's much of civilization. It's much of Western civilization. I'm seeing a lot of the same conversations take place here as I see from European and English friends. Uh, there's sort of an identity crisis going on in the modern West. And I think you know this, but to me, and I've talked about this years ago, it's like watching Jean-Paul Sartre and Foucault and Marx and Nietzsche write a script for Western civilization. It's like watching the ideas of these thinkers from long ago, before we were born, um, work themselves out. I see these ideas repeated in movies, music, uh, the news, newspapers, uh, CNN, mainstream public figures, politicians. The ideas of Nietzsche and those who followed him, Judith Butler, Sartre, Foucault, post-human, post-Christian, post-modern, uh, deconstructionist views, just sort of working themselves out in a society. And people my age, now I'm a millennial, but people younger than me too, and some older, often have these ideas that they adopt from society around them. And I don't think that they know from where these ideas come. And sometimes people will say these things as though they're original. Be aware of the ideas, where they came from, who they came from, and how they worked themselves out to be mainstream so that teenagers and 20-somethings are repeating the ideas of Foucault or Sartre or Marx. It's also important to keep in mind that Marx is not, uh, Marxism is not just an economic system. Marxism is a way of viewing history human nature, society, there's a Marxist literary theory. Uh, and these ideas of um, separating society into a binary of oppressor and oppressed. Uh, so you see all social phenomena as oppressor <laughs> and oppressed. And unfortunately, forgive me, I have a cold. You have, unfortunately, people who um, are trying to present themselves as being lower in this hierarchy of victimhood, that, that really does come back from this idea of a, a superstructure from Marx that's uh, sort of oppressing uh, the people along the margins or within it, whether you read Derrida. Seeing society as this sort of a monolithically oppressive, oppressive thing, um, and I've, I've tragically heard people refer to this as sort of white or heteronormative, or I've heard the, the phrase Christian supremacist. People who use these phrases don't know where these phrases come from, and I don't think they understand the system. I see these ideas playing out. Now, if you know me, uh, I've not been a fan of the GOP in my country, the Republican Party, for quite some time. Uh, I think the Republican Party has its own issues. And I think with the advent of Donald Trump, uh, in the last 10 years or so, you have a more post-Christian, in some ways, uh, secularizing right. It's sort of this weird thing where it's becoming both more religious and less religious. And I think as it becomes less Christian, it's not becoming better. Uh, and Donald Trump is, I can say a lot of good things about what he did as a president, but um, interestingly enough, I've seen the Republican Party shift to things when I was younger, I would have been anathematized by my conservative friends for supporting, uh, you know, gay marriage or uh, gay rights or uh, abortion, anything like this. And the Republican Party has shifted more into that to where it looks a little bit more like the Democratic Party of the 90s in some ways. Though I'm not a fan of the GOP, I am really not a fan of 
the current left. And one of my concerns is that the left has moved so far left in the last 10 years, right around 2012 or so, uh, during the middle of President Obama's presidency, it began shifting further and further left. And the things that they said they argued for was this, but then they pushed so much past that to where I could say, yeah, I would agree with this, but they just push and push and push. Now the election's coming up Tuesday, and I think that the left is changing to the point where I think older Democrats don't quite understand just how far left and with sort of Marxist cultural theory that many Democrats on the left hold to. And the leadership in that party, the senior leadership, is uh, appeasing it. What I think long term is that the Democratic Party unchanged, that they continue on this trajectory, will be something unrecognizable. In fact, it already almost is to the Democratic Party of the 90s. Uh, I don't see that trajectory slowing down unless they suffer so many losses that it causes that party to rethink their strategy. But when the old guard dies and they're aging, um, the, the new guard, the, the millennials, and past that, uh, I, I think of the AOCs of the world, are so far further left of someone like a Bill Clinton in the 90s or Joe Lieberman. I don't think older Democrats sometimes see this. They don't quite, they're not putting the pieces together. And this brings me to a larger point. One of the reasons they, they don't is because they grew up watching ABC, NBC, CBS, reading the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. And sometimes I think people don't really understand that those institutions have changed also. Even Drudge Report, uh, I saw an article, I think Drudge Report lost something like 80%, I think, of its readership. And they said this was because right-wing newspapers are losing their readership. The Drudge Report is, at this point is anything but right-wing. I mean, it's basically just repeating the talking points of the postmodern left. And the conservative leadership left <laughs> a long time ago. This is all symptomatic of the fragmenting of modern society. We don't have much that holds us together. Perhaps in the 1700s, this country had its issues but it also had sort of like a coherent vision of what America was supposed to be. I think around World War II, there's issues, there's, there was racism, there were some fascists in this country, there were definitely communists in, among the intellectual elite in this country. But overall, the average person, I think, had so much in common that they had this shared vision of what America was and something about what it was supposed to do. There was a hint of that in 9-11. Though we were parting ways ideologically as Americans, uh, I think uh, I was there. I, I remember um, watching people sing God Bless America at the Capitol building. Uh, some of my friends enlisted. I, I later enlisted in the Marine Corps. But whatever it was that unified us. I think now at this point, uh, those things are quickly disintegrating. What does it mean to be an American? I think unfortunately, we can't even have an answer for that without being called a, a name. I've been called plenty of names. Ideologically, we're going separate ways. Uh, and it's not just two sides, it's a fragmenting. And I can criticize, you know, the Republican Party and notice with honesty how it's changed. And then the left, I think, is moving so far left that it's unrecognizable and it's, uh, in some cases, openly, patently un-American, proudly so. Now it rallies and, you know, Conventions, they fly the American flag and they'll, you know, they might bow their head for prayer. But if you listen to the leadership and if you read 
the ideas that are informing their views, um, these are certainly post-American views. Um, so you have this, for lack of a better word, woke, uh, even liberal, leftist, what do those words even mean anymore? Liberal doesn't, doesn't particularly mean what it meant in the Enlightenment. This Enlightenment rationalist who believes in natural rights, like John Locke. Uh, liberal has morphed. And then you have leftists. And then you have wokeness. But these are really just, this wokeness is just Sartre and Foucault and Marx. And Marx was sort of repackaged, by the way, when Marxism failed economically. Look, at, look up the new left. It was sort of repackaged. In fact, even Jean-Paul Sartre tried to reconcile his existentialism with Marxism uh, around the 1940s. And those ideas have certainly informed uh, this gender theory, uh, third wave feminism, things like this. This is all packaged and sold as being nice to people, nice to minorities, which is a wonderful thing to be. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that. But the bait and switch. People have fallen for these divisive, false ideologies. And then to watch postmodernism, in a sense, show itself on the right, to me, is concerning. And it even still, you have a non-woke party still versus a woke party. And that's what we're left with. What happens after the election? I don't need to tell you that um, lots of people are skeptical about the election process in this country at this point. Um, in Pennsylvania, they have found, I think, I think it was something like 2,000 votes, cases of voter fraud in one county they're investigating. That was this year, recently. Uh, Virginia tried to take off non-citizens off of the register, and a uh, Biden appointed judge told them to put those names that the, the governor and you know vice governor, lieutenant governor, said, we know that these people have told us they're not citizens, so they don't need to be registered to vote. And the Biden appointed judge told them to put them back on, and then the Supreme Court, I think, said, okay, halt that, take them off. You had supposedly a case, I haven't verified this, but supposedly a case of a kid in Florida uh, trying to intimidate voters. You had ballot boxes being burned in Washington state. And in this fragmenting, it seems to me that people who watch Jimmy Kennel, you know, Colbert, uh, read the New York Times primarily as their news source, will see that the right questions elections. And sometimes people on the right do and I think they're becoming ever more suspicious with these things. People on the left have questioned elections. Uh, the governor of Georgia, that election several years ago, the, candidate, the Democratic candidate who lost went around for years claiming that she was the, uh, the actual governor of Georgia. Um, when Trump won the election in 2016, I saw Hillary Clinton and people who supported her basically claimed that Trump was not legitimately elected. The voting machines were hacked by the Russians. It's not just the right who does this, but based on the news sources that you follow, if you're my age, it might be YouTube or podcasts or Facebook. If you're younger, TikTok. If you're older, ABC News. Your worldview is increasingly parted, disconnected from your political opponents. So I don't need to tell you that this election, I think a lot really does hang on it. Uh, the direction that this country is going to go in our institutions, because it's not just a president you elect, it's the hundreds or thousands of people in these positions who make decisions that come with it. What's going to happen after the election if Trump wins? Um, you're going to have several more years of the media uh, questioning and attacking everything that he says or does, sometimes fairly and oftentimes unfairly. Years ago, I watched when President Obama was president, I watched Fox News very unfairly 
criticize President Obama. I mean, just nitpick things that didn't matter, that weren't even true. Uh, and I think the man's policies could be certainly criticized. Maybe I'll do that one day. I try to have an objective look, I think, or a fair look at Obama's presidency. But the right-wing news would just slander him. And I thought, this is ridiculous. And the left-wing media said, hold my beer. I, I could, I, when Trump was in, I watched so many press, live press conferences with the guy. Or I would go back and research or watch a full video clip of things that happened, like the kid from Kentucky in D.C. who was at a, a pro-life rally and was basically accused of being a white supremacist Nazi. And then you watch the full clip. No such thing. The media ran with this narrative because it fit the narrative. So many instances like this, Jesse Smollett, uh, so many things that Trump says taken out of context, or dwelt on when someone on the left says something just as divisive. It's not dwelt on. So you're left with the feeling of toxicity about uh, President Trump, but not about President Biden, who also makes extremely divisive comments. He's just a little bit more, uh, mm, I'm not sure articulate is the word. If Harris gets in, I'm not sure people will trust the results. If that's not the case, whoever wins, the country will not be immediately unified. Because these are band-aids. What's beneath is what's feeding the deep division. That's what has to be addressed. We're going to continue without some paradigm altering event to divide ideologically uh, and cause tension between families and friends and neighbors. And I could sort of think about where this would go ultimately. If this happens, then this and this and this might happen. I, I could certainly spe speculate about that. But here's what else I know. What am I going to do? Whoever wins the election, whenever we find out uh, the announcement about who won the election, whether it's the day of or whenever, here's what I recommend. Get up. Go to work. Love your spouse. Spend time with your children. Read to them, take them for walks, play with them. Go to church. Pray. Because ultimately the decisions up here do trickle down to us. But we're still human beings. We still have to live our lives. And one thing I found helpful is during COVID when in the Black Lives Matter uh, riots, and though this wasn't covered, uh, people were hurt, uh, lots of property damage. Um, I mean, I just watched it more than the news. I watched it on cell phone video, or I had friends who uh, had to change their lives a bit because of uh, the, the potential of violence around them in some of the cities. What I noticed was when I went to the grocery store, people were tense. Uh, it's almost like people feel like they didn't fit in in their own country. They didn't know who was their neighbor or who was an opponent. And I remember being in the self-checkout line at Walmart and people of different colors and, you know, clearly backgrounds standing in line and things were just tense. And I remember thinking, everyone's nervous, I'm a little nervous, this is nonsense, this is BS. And so I just turned to the guy beside me and I just smiled and stuck up a conversation, I told a couple jokes. And I remember everybody in line <laughs> took a deep breath. Like, oh yeah, we're still doing normal things here. We're just normal people in the grocery store. And that one little act sort of like changed everybody's perception and mood. It just eased and calmed the tension. So that's what I would suggest doing. That's what I'm going to try to do. I, uh, I can be a, a, uh, I spent time in the Marine Corps, and I can be a, 
I can be a confrontational person. I can be a little bit arrogant, a little cocky. Uh, I don't back down from a fight like I did before the Marine Corps, at least not out of fear. But what I know is that not every fight is worth fighting. And you can't fight all the time. Sometimes it's good to remember that your conservative uncle, your, your super ultra MAGA uncle, may not be an evil person. Your cousin, your brother, your sister, your neighbor, with the purple hair who's, you know, uh, you know, got the nose ring and the Kamala Harris sign. There's good things about that person too. So find them and love them. So just a quick verse. This is what I'm going to try to do. After the election, we're still going to be human beings who have to get along. Whether you're Republican, Democrat, fundamentalist, rigid Christian, a fundamentalist atheist, rigid leftist, who, anything in between, uh, we're going to have to get along until we don't. The scripture says this, and I try to live by this even though sometimes I don't. Uh, the scripture says, If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And that's Romans 12. What's going to happen after the election? Well, we're probably going to continue to divide until something else happens. I hope we address the underlying ideological issues that are dividing us. That's what has to be addressed. And that's one of the reasons I'm a Catholic now. But we're still going to have to live together, and I hope we can find ways to just, in our daily lives, remember what's important, our family, our, our hobbies, bettering ourselves, and uh, being kind to others, loving our enemies, loving our neighbors, and living peace will be with all as much as we can. Anyway, I hope these thoughts were interesting to you. Uh, would you do me a favor? Pray for our country, pray for the election, pray for the election workers, and uh, pray for our neighbors and our communities in the days following the election. I'd very much appreciate that. As always, I appreciate your time. I know you're busy, so thanks for watching. God bless.